This is a battery, a car battery. This is also a battery commonly used in electric bikes. Yeah, that kind of e-bikes. And this, this is an old empty ammunition box. Thanks to its rugged design and watertight seal, I'll be using it as a case to build a powerful lithium ion battery pack. Now, if you're thinking I'm just grab a bunch of 18650 lithium cells, slap them into cell holders, spot weld them together and call it done, think again. I've used 18650 cells before and they are a great power source for custom batteries in many applications. But this time I'm using something even better, industrial grade lithium cells. I've used this before in my go-kart project and since I still have some leftovers, it is the perfect opportunity to make a dedicated video highlighting the pros and cons of why I choose them. First, they came with their own brackets, making it easy to stack them and quickly change the battery configuration. For example, this 30S 48V battery pack can instantly become a 10S 36V pack by simply removing free cells. It's that easy. Second, these cells are connecting using M3 balls through the copper tabs, which is one of my favorite features. Oh, and I almost forgot to mention the name of these cells. They are EAG EPLB C020B cells. And lastly, by sheer luck, they are just slightly smaller than an ammo box, making it perfect case for them. Each EPLB cell has a 20 amp hours capacity, delivers 100 continuous and 200 speed discharge and cost me 15 euros per cell. To get similar performance with cylindrical lithium cells, I need either 7 18650 cells or 5 21 700 cells. Sure, I could match the capacity and discharge current by connecting enough of them in series, but the cost will be higher. One clear difference? Size and weight. That's where cylindrical cells shine. But since I have plenty of space in the ammo box and I'm not concerned about every extra gram, it is not an issue for this build. And lastly, the ease of assembly is a huge, huge advantage. EPLB cells are designed to be easily stacked and connected using bus bars and screws. In contrast, 18650 or 21700 cells requires additional holders and spot welding to assemble. Since they need copper tabs for high discharge currents, welding them is challenging. It requires a powerful and expensive spot welder. So once again, stackable EPLV cells win for simplicity and convenience. To keep the cells firmly in place, each bracket has a mounting hole. I used M6 threaded rod, measured and cut to exact weight of the battery pack. With a nylock nut and washer securing one end, the rod was inserted and tightened to hold everything together. The top of the battery pack is secured using stackable cell clips and threaded rod, while the bottom is held in place with a captain tape. Since I need bus bars to connect the cells in series, I wanted maximum performance and decided to use 3mm thick copper. I designed the bus bars in Fusion 360 based on the cell layout and called up a friend to see if his CNC machine was available. A few hours later, I had freshly milled bus bars and was ready to move forward with the build. If you don't have access to friend with machining skills or expensive equipment in your workshop, you can always outsource the service to a provider like PCBWay. All you need to do is select the service, upload your file and choose from variety of materials. In less than a minute, you can customize material properties and fabrication options to fit your project. One of my favorite features, the wide range of surface finishes. 18 options in this case. This includes brushed finishes, various powder coating colors, and even spray plating in rare and expensive metals, like nickel, silver, or even gold. Plus, they offer other chemical or physical treatments to meet different needs. Whether you're working on a hobby project or professional prototype, PCBWay has you covered with high quality manufacturing and competitive pricing. Their easy to use platform lets you upload files, get instant quotes and enjoy reliable shipping, helping you bring your ideas to life effortlessly. Check out their website in the description below to see what they can make for you. To secure the bus bars, I'll use M3 button head bolts. I needed to place them one by one and secure them with four bolts per cell. I take my time here, making sure to avoid accidental contact with Elrodin style bus bars, which could cause a short circuit or sparking. If everything is connected correctly, I shall get around 50 volts. 
which is exactly what I want. The main positive and negative terminals will be connected using 10 AVG silicon wire. To ensure solid contact with the flat terminals, I'll use a small copper tube. One end will hold the wire, while the other will be flattened for connection. To do this, I placed a pair of angle irons in my bench wise. This prevents the vise from imprinting its texture on the copper tube. Since copper is a soft metal, shaping it to the desired form wasn't difficult. While the vise held it steady, I slowly formed the tube needed shape. After a pair M3 holes were drilled, the main terminals could be mounted in place. Right now, 13 cells are connected in series, providing 48 volts. One of the biggest advantages of these cells is their modular design. Just loosen two nuts, add more cells and connect them with bus bars. And that's exactly what I plan to do soon, increasing the battery voltage from 48 volts to 60. More voltage means more power and speed. But for that, I need to wait for my new electric motor to arrive. To protect and balance the battery cells during charging and discharging, I'll install a BMS. I've had great experience with an BMS, and this small unit is rated for 80 amps continuous and 200 amps peak discharge, a perfect match for these cells. First, I need to extend the battery wires. Since my setup doesn't exceed 60 amps continuous discharge, 10 AVG wires is more than enough. The ideal spot for the BMS is right here. To prevent metal-on-metal -metal contact, I placed a fiberglass sheet under it. The rest of the surface will be insulated with fish paper. I secured the BMS in place using double-sided tape, then started planning the wiring. I also insulated the path over the bus bars, since the balance wires will be routed there. To keep things organized while I work, I temporarily taped the balance wires in place, leaving enough length for final connection. Yeah, this wiring looks like a spaghetti mess right now, but one by one each balance wire will be trimmed, crimped and secured to its designated cell. Following the provided wiring diagram, this step was pretty straightforward. Each wire end was crimped to a ring terminal and secured to the bus bar with a bolt. It is a repetitive and time-consuming process, but the final result was totally worth it. Here's a small trick. I placed double-sided tape under the balance wires to keep them tidy and in place. It worked perfectly. Before connecting the last balance wire, I need to crimp the main power wires. The copper tube I used earlier was the perfect size for 10 AVG wire. Since copper is soft, the crimping pliers handle the job with ease. Once crimped, this connection isn't going anywhere. To reduce exposed metal surfaces, I used heat shrink tubing, then secured everything back in place. And honestly, this is the cleanest wiring job I've done on any of my projects. I'm super happy with how it looks. And a little sad that all this neat wiring will be hidden inside the case. The BMS kit includes two temperature sensors, one routed to the front and the other to the back of the battery pack. With everything done, I covered and insulated all terminals. To secure the balance wires, I used captain tape and as the final layer of insulation, I applied fish paper. Quite a neat battery pack comes together. Now it's time to connect the balance connectors in a specific order. It is important to start with the most negative side as per the instructions. Two additional wires are connected temporarily. They are only used once to boot up the BMS. To jumpstart the BMS, it needs at least 3 volts, and a single 18650 cell did the trick. Once powered, the red LED confirmed that the BMS is on and ready to connect to the smartphone. A QR code on the unit provided a direct link to the App Store for downloading the BMS app. After opening the app, I selected Bluetooth protocol to connect. In the device list, my BMS was the first option, so I tapped to connect. At first, the app displayed errors and incorrect data. That's because the battery configuration didn't match the BMS preset. Fortunately, fixing this was easy, just a few parameters needed adjusting. In the Parameter Set section, open Pack Parameters. Select the correct battery type, in this case Lithium Ion, then press the setting button to confirm. Enter the correct number of cells in series, which for me is 13. Lastly, set the battery capacity in physical and remaining fields. That's it only four settings needed adjustment. After saving the changes and returning to the main screen, everything looked correct. No errors, battery capacity displayed properly, and all cell voltages were visible. Since the cells had a very small voltage deviation, I enabled automatic balancing in the BMS control section. Let's check the main screen again. The app highlights higher voltage cells in green, indicating the balancing process. Now let's move on to the enclosure. 
For obvious reasons, I cannot just drop battery pack inside the case. Not only is it a metal box, but the bottom isn't flat, meaning the battery will rock back and forth. To fix this, I designed a custom solution in Fusion 360 and 3D printed from PATG plastic. Actually, I printed two similar pieces. These parts are designed to match the uneven bottom of the box and fit around the battery complex shape. This design allows both pieces to be inserted freely from either end, ensuring snug fit and solid protection. To keep them together, I fixed them with stripped fiberglass tape. And now, one of the most satisfying moments. The fitment. And perfect. Like a glove. The power wires needed to be routed through the lid out of the ammo box. Luckily, the lid is detachable, making it easy to place on a drill press. I used a step drill bit to make two 12mm holes. That's why I had marked it with a blue tape. Not sure if my drill bit was extra sharp or if the metal was just soft, but it went through super easy. To ensure tight, waterproof seal, I used PG7 cable glands. These are designed for 3.5 to 6mm wires. Ideally, I prefer metal ones, but at the time I could only find plastic. Since the kit didn't include a rubber seal, I used silicone sealant instead. A bit of a messy process, but now it is 100% sealed. After a quick cleanup, it looked great, and lid could be mounted back. I routed the wires carefully, leaving enough slack inside the battery case so I can open later if needed without damaging the connections. After closing the lid, I tightened the cable glance caps to secure the wires in place. And the last step was to solder XT90 connector. A 40 volt soldering iron and the right amount of solder got the job done perfectly. By the way, that green line on XT90 connector, it means it has an anti-spark feature. And I highly recommend using this type of connector for safety. Here's a wire management trick I always use when dealing with loose wires. A simple bundling method that keeps everything neat and organized. Works every time. Inside the battery case, there is a gap between the battery and the lid. To prevent unwanted contact in case the battery flips over, I 3D printed custom spacers and secured them in all four corners with double-sided tape. And last but not least, a branding sticker. Now, if anyone opens this box in the future, they'll know who built this masterpiece. And just a quick reminder why I'm using an ammo box for this battery. It's simple. These boxes are extremely durable, waterproof, and built to withstand serious abuse. That makes them perfect for protecting sensitive components like lithium batteries. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching, and until next time, bye.